Good morning. Welcome, my friends, to the Congregational Church of North Barnstead, an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are so very welcome to be here with us this morning. Welcome to you who are here in person and you who are joining us online. Good morning, Pat. Let us know if you have a prayer request by either raising your hand or typing it in the comments. Everyone here is welcome to participate in however way they can. We have an exciting Sunday today. First of all, we're getting back into the Gospel of Mark for a little debate between Jesus and the Pharisees. Hmm? Okay. So Jesus and the Pharisees are going to have a little debate about hand washing, so we can get excited about that. But also today we have a special guest. Lori is here from N68 Hours of Hunger to share a bit about our special offering for this month. And I am hoping that Gail Murphy is on her way this morning because she was is meant to celebrate communion for us this week. Callum and I got um, a fun toddler sickness, so we have been home together all week. So while I feel decent today, I don't want to share any lingering illness with you. So if Gail doesn't show up, I'll wear a mask. We'll figure it out. (laughs) But for now, I invite you to settle into your seats. Take a deep, grounding breath. Let us center our hearts and minds on the spirit of worship. Let's listen to our prelude. Good morning, friends. Let's worship God is good. Uh, friends, let's wor- let us worship God today, for God is great. God has blessed oh. us with life, with faith, and with beauty. Let us worship God today, for God is good. God forgives us and encourages us and calls us by name. Let us worship God today. Because we are God's people. Let us worship God who knows our hearts and loves us deeply. Let us uh, pray. Holy, Holy One, join us here this Sunday morning as we pray and sing and meditate on your desires for us and for the world. May our songs be songs of res- Your 
night is calm, the mountains burst in song. Rise up like eagles on the wing, God's power will make us strong. You may be seated. In our scripture passage this morning, Jesus talks about the source of sin. He says that sin does not come from the outside. It's not a list of things handed down from on high that we do or fail to do. For example, in this scripture passage, it's not whether or not you wash your hands before you eat. That determines whether or not you have committed a sin. Sin comes with it from within, each of us. Then he makes a list of his own, including... In the list of possible sins, things like deceit or envy, slander or pride, that in his words defile a person. This, my friends, is a nuanced argument because both of them involve little lists. The important difference is that the first list you get from an outside source, someone telling you what is or is not a sin, an objective rule book that if only you follow it, you will be good in the eyes of God. The second list, Jesus' list is subjective. It comes from within each of us. And there are things that create, they are all things that create spiritual barriers between ourselves and God or one another. Sin, I believe, is anything that you do that distances you from your relationship with God. Only you can know what a sin is to you. They won't be the same for everyone, and they can't necessarily be viewed or judged from the outside. And so while we enter into this public time of confession, I want you to know that this is truly a personal time between you and God. Let us confess our sins together and restore our relationship with the divine. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy One, hear our prayer. Sometimes our lives are a mess because of choices we have made or because of choices others have made. Sometimes our lives are great and we are kind and generous. Sometimes our lives are great and we forget to be grateful and humble. We trust that in the jumble of all this, you are present. We trust that you are with us, walking with us when we stray, nudging us back to the right path, slowing us down when we get ahead of you, and waiting for us when we lag behind. So we thank you and ask for your forgiveness and pray that you will stay with us throughout the journey. Amen. Beloved of God, standing here, I can hear the wind go through the leaves. And it reminds me of the movement of the Spirit in our lives. God moves in us all the time. We are forgiven. We are able to always return back to the Spirit, back to be close to God. You are forgiven, and you are loved. Amen. So, We hear in the scriptures that every act, every breath is a prayer uh, to God, that in our daily beings, we live as beings close to God. And I believe that is what our children are doing this morning out in the world. My prayer for them is that they are moving through the world feeling loved and cherished and close to God. I'm going to spare you my weird water bottle children's time this morning, mainly because I forgot the water bottle, so it's good. (laughs) But let us rise together and pass the peace. My friends, may the peace of God be with you. Now share it with one another.
Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of the disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all of the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesies rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever speaks evil of father and mother must surely die. But you say, if, you say that if anyone tells father or mother, whatever support you may have from me is Corban, that is an offering to God, then you no longer permit doing anything for a father or mother, thus making void the word of God through your tradition that you have handed on. And you do many things like this. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is, for it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, Envy, slander, pride, folly, all these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. If you were reading along, you'll notice that um, Cheryl offered the, interpret the, the scripture translation that is newest for this text. There's a new Revised Standard Version coming out, a new New Revised Standard Version coming out that translates fornication as sexual immorality, and I think that that is much closer to the truth of the gospel. In any case, so thank you, Cheryl. Good, good catching, yeah. Will you pray with me? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Jesus and his disciples were tired. They had been working, ministering almost nonstop for weeks to people who were in serious need. Day after day, week after week, they were traveling all over, healing the sick and casting out unclean spirits and spreading the good news about the kingdom of God. They even fed 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and some fish, a miraculous show of abundance. They were caught up in a holy revolution, transforming communities and showing people that their lives, their health, their hunger, their oppression mattered to God. Their message was radical, and Jesus wasn't shy about confronting the systems that were failing the most vulnerable. And everywhere they went, great crowds of people were following them, thirsty for this good news that Jesus was preaching. However, as meaningful and important as this ministry was, it was taking a toll on this little group of rabble-rousers, Jesus and his friends. Jesus believed in self-care as much as the next person, but there didn't seem to be any time for rest these days. Mark tells us that Jesus and his disciples were working so hard they could barely find any time to eat. So maybe you can understand how the Pharisees that had come down from Jerusalem may have found themselves on Jesus's very last nerve when they chose to make their sanctimonious point about hand washing, the one moment the disciples were actually able to carve out some time for lunch. Why don't your disciples wash their hands before they eat, the Pharisees probed. Aren't they breaking tradition? And it seems to me that Jesus just sort of snapped a little bit. 
He's reached his breaking point, and it shows in his response. He calls the Pharisees hypocrites, invoking Isaiah, the people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Because, and this is true, beyond the tradition of the elders, there is no rule in the Hebrew Bible that requires hand washing before a meal. Look throughout Deuteronomy and Leviticus, anywhere in our Old Testament, you won't find a line about hand washing. What you will find, though, is one big commandment that might sound familiar to you. You shall honor your father and mother. Which, of course, is where Jesus goes next. It seems to me that he might have had one particular set of elderly folks in mind. Some people, perhaps he had fed loaves and fishes to or had visited in their homes that were destitute when he shoots back the Corbin at the Pharisees. The Corbin was a ritual offering to God, one that was given through the temple, kind of like our version of pledging today, to my understanding. Except it was far more intense, because once something was declared Corbin, It couldn't be used for anything else, including caring for your family. Jesus accused the Pharisees of basically using God's name in vain, encouraging people to declare their wealth to God, to the temple, so that the institution would thrive even at the expense of, say, their aging parents. You nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, he says. Now, hand-washing and pledging... I think it might be hard to find two back-to-back examples of first-century religious behavior in the Bible that means so much to us here in the 21st century. The last time this scripture came up in the lectionary, it was 2021, a year into a global pandemic. I'll tell you, it was challenging to preach a text that seemed to argue against hand-washing at that time. Hand-washing, in those days especially, had become almost a symbol of caring for our community, right? Of stopping the spread of loving your neighbor. And pledging, well, this is a tough one for me personally as a pastor. I believe in supporting this place in the power it has to build community and change lives and bring peace and love and justice. But I also know that in this time we are spread thin. Inflation is so very high. And there are people, I bet, that we can each picture in our minds that are having trouble making ends meet. Other causes that are immediate and dire. Other organizations like N68 Hours of Hunger that we'll hear about later in this service that need our financial support so badly to try to close the gaping holes in our social safety net. And so when you pledge here, I know, actually I hope, that it's just a fraction of the giving that you do in any given year. And I'm totally okay with that because both of these things, hand washing in 2020 and giving in the 21st century, when seen in the light of Jesus, are ways that we too act out our priorities and values and indeed our faith in the world. Which is why I think the debate between Jesus and the Pharisees is so heated this morning. Because for them, it's not just a back and forth about two little policies, hand washing, Corbin giving. At stake is a philosophy philosophy about faith and authority. The Pharisees want to know, who does Jesus think he is to flout the tradition of the elders? For the Pharisees, it seems like Jesus was ignoring their authority and encouraging others to do so as well, calling himself more aligned with God than they, and ultimately threatening their power. And Jesus challenges them right back, asking them to confront how their traditions contribute to or keep them from fulfilling the will of God. This moment in the book of Mark is a quintessential illustration of Jesus' ministry and message. Jesus constantly put real people over written norms or preferential power. He healed lepers and told them to tell no one. He cured the elements of little girls and sick women He fed people so that they could continue to hear the good news. And any time we see him get angry in the Bible, he's angry about hypocrisy. Or the times the actions of people who profess the faith are not aligned with God. 
In fact, if we look at the list of things that Jesus would count as defilement, as sins that come from within, we see a relational list. Sins that hurt ourselves or others. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, folly. All of these are ways that we injure or betray or belittle one another. All of them get to the core of his message that God's priority is the flourishing of creation. If Jesus were to pick a hill to die on, it would be that real faith, true faith, is about love in action. And actually, die on this hill he would. The Gospel of Mark doesn't waste words. What Matthew and Luke take 28 and 24 chapters to tell us, Mark squishes into 16 chapters. Mark writes with intention, telling us three or four stories in five or six sentences, it seems sometimes. I might be exaggerating a little. When Mark takes time to say that the Pharisees came down from Jerusalem, he's giving us a little flag, a little pointer to the end of the story, to the last time Jesus would be in Jerusalem at the crucifixion. Mark makes it clear that this moment, this little debate about hand-washing or gift-giving is tied directly to the cross. There are many people out in this world that would say that Jesus died for our sins. There are lots of reasons. I don't really like this. A discussion for another time. But one of them is that for me, the for could be translated a little closer to because. Jesus died perhaps because of our sins. Jesus went to the cross because the sinful world, the world mired in things like wickedness, deceit, evil, slander, pride. I should clarify, a world that has sin in it. I do believe the world was made good, and that is still true. Okay. But anyway, this world, this world controlled by the powers that we still have among us today, right? We know that power in this world can be used for evil. These powers could not handle someone who over and over read love into the law, prioritized people over profit and integrity over institution. Jesus went to the cross because those in power didn't have the imaginative capacity to open their hearts to a world which no, in which no one hungers. Everyone is treated with dignity, in which creation is able not just to survive, but to thrive. Perhaps Jesus was crucified because it was the only outcome the power at the time could accept for such a table-turning, world-shifting love. But there is good news in this sort of heavy, dense sermon. God is more powerful than sin, too alive for death and faithful beyond our imagination. Thank God the crucifixion is not the end of our story. We wouldn't be here today if it was. We are still working towards what Jesus died in the name of, a vision of a world in which the traditions we uphold, the actions we take, are always in service of life, love, and the flourishing of all God's children. And so in this time when systems are still failing so many, where injustice seems so rampant, Jesus' challenge to the Pharisees echoes down the centuries to us. Let's examine, do we as individuals and as a church prioritize the love of God and neighbor, neighbor over the love of our own traditions and conveniences? Do we stand with those in need, even when it's uncomfortable, even if it's costly? Let's commit ourselves to the work of making sure that in our tradition and in our action, we find ourselves, like Jesus, standing firm on the hill of love, justice, and truth. May it be so, and amen.
My friends, this is the time in our service where we lift up the prayers that we have on our hearts. So I invite you to take just a minute of quiet to look into your spirits, see if there's a prayer you'd like to share aloud, see if there's anything there that you might just want to hold with God today. Take a moment for some silent prayer. If you'd like to share a prayer this morning, I invite you to end your prayer with the phrase, God of love, so that we can all pray with you through our prayer. My heart was filled with joy, as I'm sure everyone's was yesterday, to read the memo that came out. Uh, what was it called? Love is in the air. And celebrating the marriage of Joanne and Cheryl. Oh, yes. Praises be. Hallelujah. Cheryl and Joanne are married. Yeah. <laughs> and um, <laughs> on the other end of the extreme, I, I really want to offer a prayer for a situation in which I'm now aware where a young mother is incarcerated and separated for, from her children and um, you know, prayers, of course, for her and for the children who are trying to understand having a mom who was bad and had to go to prison and yeah. hopefully some people are helping a child have another vision. So, God of love. Yeah. Hear our prayers. Prayers from my few mates back behind me here. Mm -hmm. back here. <coughs> Martha, who this is her last Sunday. We're heading back to California, Los Angeles for the winter, and we will miss them. Mm. Safe travels. Hear our prayers. Prayers for my husband, Ken, who had to go back to the hospital this week. And prayers for the healthcare system. Mm because it is so messed up right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I just pray that we can find a physician that will listen to him mm -hmm. and understand what's going instead of throwing us off yeah. for the most part. So God of love, yeah. hear our prayers. I pray for a young couple that I married yesterday, Michael mm -hmm. and Kayla, and pray that this is just the beginning of a loving and wonderful life together. God of love, hear our prayers. And, and I add a, a second prayer. I found out this week that a friend that I've been meaning to get in touch with from preschool has died, and it has risen in me a lot of regret of getting old um, and watching people go that I love. And so I pray for Laura's family and I ask prayers for me in this process of mourning. God of love, hear our prayers. You should know um, I'd like to send some prayers to the family that was affected by the fire yesterday in Barnstead. On Judy Hill, I guess the husband got some burns on his knees mm -hmm. and arms. So, prayers to that family. Um, 
hope that he's going to be okay. Yeah. Let us love. Hear our prayers. I'd like to ask the prayers for my very good friend, Kathy Flanagan, and her daughter, Kelly Sigroni. Last year, Kelly lost her husband, and they have three little girls that are just babies. And Kelly's not been doing well throughout the year. And Kathy has basically taken care of the three little girls and is getting very tired. And I'd just like to ask for prayers for healing in that family. God of love, hear our prayers. My daughter, Carrie, unfortunately, uh, makes more frequent visits to the hospital than um, either she or I or anyone who knows and loves her would like. She checked herself out of the hospital a few days ago because she had been waiting 15 hours and had no serious attention. Um, only minor tests were done. And as she watched the staff move from patient to patient, they failed to wash their hands between patients. Uh, ten days ago, uh, my family s celebrated the uh, life of my brother, uh, so I asked prayers for his widow and his children and grandchildren as they accept that he is no longer with us in body and move forward into the rest of their lives, which may be particularly difficult for his wife. God of love. Hear our prayers. I'll offer a final prayer of thanksgiving for the people who stabilized our Pratt building yesterday. Prayers of thanks to Bill and Ryan and Ron and Randy and Cheryl for their hard work making sure that building is safe and uh, stable in time for our big fair in two weeks. So God of love, hear our prayers. Yay, good job. Let us pray. Gracious God, there is so much on the heart of this community today. I'm just struck by all that we carry into this space. This space is not just full of the people who show up, but all of the people that those people love. We pray that you are close to our networks that our net of spiritual holding is bigger and wider because you know each of us. You love all of us. You are holding us even when we can't feel it, even when we are disappointed by the systems that surround us that are meant to be holding us, even when we feel afraid, especially when we feel joyful. You came that we might live and have abundant life. We praise you and thank you for your presence among us. We pray that you would help us let go of the things that get in the way of us living most abundantly. Things like pride or self-certainty or doubt or fear. All that keeps us from your present and sort of keeps us from the wonder of your truth. Renewing God, we thank you for the merciful wind of your spirit who breathes us into new life and new hope and leads us to new understanding and new wholeness. We pray that the, the knowledge of your presence would grow within us so that when we hit life's big hurdles, life's deep grief, life's surprising new turns, 
We are overflowing with your love and mercy and gentleness so that we can use your presence with us to transform the world around us. May we take what you have given us and share it with others. We pray all this in the name of our teacher, friend, and model, your son Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. morning we have a mission moment. I'll invite Lori forward to share about N68 Hours of Hunger in I believe Barnstead and Pittsfield. Um, I'll let her do the talking. I do have a loud voice. <laughs> oh that's right. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I've heard so many wonderful things about Kate, so it was really nice to actually feel her spirit and her service this morning. It was beautiful, so I'm so glad I came. Um, so I'm here today to talk about N68 Hours of Hunger. Um, we've been in Barnstead for, I don't know, about eight years now, I think it's been, that we started this in the school. Um, so what, and for some of you who don't know, N68 Hours of Hunger, the reason why it's called N68 is because we give kids, uh, families to kids, um, bags of food on Friday until Monday when they return from, turn back to school. So that's 68 hours. So we give them three dinners. I always forget what it is because it's never, I'm getting old. Three dinners, two lunches, two breakfasts, and some snacks. So we fill the bags with that food for them to have um, over the weekend so they don't go hungry. There are some families that, you know, struggle, um, some families that just uh, need it a little bit, a little bit helps. Um, uh, so we do our best to try to provide uh, that food, that supplement for those families on the weekends. So the program... Um, is a wonderful program. It's it's actually grown out to, I think it's in California now. Um, so it's been growing. Uh, there is a huge need for this program. And we typically work with schools and social workers to help find families in need. We also reach out to the community, to churches, to social workers, um, to programs like Head Start. Um, you know, to try to reach out and make sure that families know that this program exists um, because a lot of families don't know about it. Um, so that's what's important is making sure that we get the word out to our local community churches and schools and uh, any, any place that serves people in the community. Um, so this year um, has been very interesting. Um, we usually get about maybe, it's very slow to, re to recruit families in the beginning of the year. Even though we go on the community page and put out there seeking families, um, this year has been very interesting. We have actually have, be before the school even started, we had 31 kids sign up for this program, which is unheard of. So that is very interesting and it tells us a story that this program is really needed this year. Um, so we're, we're a little nervous about how we're going to meet the needs. Um, 
not just with food food where i'm not too worried about i mean i we always need the food and we need help of volunteers like people to draw we in in barmstead um we used to have um we used to let have the families pick the bags up at the school but that we had a lot of issues with that you know kids leaving the bags on the school buses um or leaving them in the hallways in the school over the weekend so we came up with this idea that we would deliver the bags to the families um in the in barnstead and so we've been doing that for the last several years and it's worked out pretty good but we're hoping we have enough delivery drivers we're i'm a little nervous about that right now i worked on the um the list yesterday and put everything together and i'm like oh goodness i hope i hope we have enough ability to deliver these bags so we are looking i i may be looking for some volunteer drivers we typically do it on fridays between uh they pack the bags they get meet at 8 30 in the morning at, over on fayette street in pittsfield in the old head start building and um and then the delivery drivers come, they pick up the bags, we give them their routes and they go deliver to the families. They just take the bags and they drop them off on the, the family's doorsteps. Um, so it, that I'm a little worried about. So if you know anybody that um, may be interested in being a delivery driver, there's no pay for it, but we do, we do sometimes be able to give like $10 a week or $5 a week for gas. Um, if, if, we'll figure out how to make that happen if we have to give gas money. So there is an opportunity we, we might be able to do that this year. So, um, so yeah, so that's our, one of my biggest concerns of needs this year is uh, looking for volunteers to, to deliver food. Um, we also added, uh, I think two years ago, we added Pittsfield um, and there was a pro there has been a program in Pittsfield like our program not called n68 um, and it's worked pretty good um, so they didn't re I asked if they wanted to merge with us and they didn't want to so we didn't really serve a lot of Pittsfield families only this year things have changed so this year the school reached out to us and now they do want to merge with us and we had a lot of Pittsfield families sign up so now we also, I'm also concerned about that. So um, we're meeting with them on Tuesday and hopefully we can get some volunteers from the Pittsfield community and, and, and make this program happen for that community stronger as well. So, um, so that's what's going on with the community. The program itself, there is no income requirements for it. Um, if you have a need, all you have to do is fill out the form and sign it that says you waive us from delivering foods or whatever, and you're okay with us delivering foods. Um, and tell us how many kids in the family. Um, we typically serve kids uh, that are in school. So all kids that are in school, but we also, um, if they're in preschool or three years old, you know, in, in the Head Start programs, we also count them as well. Um, so, that's all that is required is that you have kids in school um, and um, and also what we do is at Thanksgiving and Christmas we give them a turkey with um, you know non-perishable stuff like uh, cranberry stuffing things like canned cranberry stuff like that um, the, the turkey we get donated by the food bank um, and so they've been very generous um, with families so we just have to give them a list of all the families prior, like usually in September, or October, and then we go pick up the turkeys. Um, so Christmas and Thanksgiving, we try to provide that with to all the families as well. And then at Easter time, we have a wonderful woman in the community, in Pittsfield community, Connie Fellows, who um, is so generous um, and the community is very generous donating to her all the Easter baskets. So we usually ask the families for the names, whether it's a boy and how what their ages are. So we, we gather that information as well, only so we can, you know, make sure they get Easter baskets. So that's all that's required to sign up for this program. You don't have to be low income. You, you don't have to fill out any financial statements, nothing like that. You just tell us, hey, yeah, we're in need. And, and I did bring a few. I only had five of each um, 
some you know seeking families in the registration process on here um so i'll leave that in the back for people that um, know anyone that might benefit from the program and then i also have some handouts that if you want to do donations what are the, some of the things that we look for for donations we reach out to the community a lot like the business community um, like the Pittsfield Rotary is doing a food drive for us, local real estate offices and banks, uh, Profile Bank, um, I think, is it Remax? A couple of different um, real estate agencies will do uh, food drives for us. We give them this list and they'll collect food for about a month and then they deliver it or we pick it up um, and bring it to our storage unit. So, you know, uh, if you're interested in doing a food drive or any volunteer needs, want to meet any volunteer needs, we would welcome that. Um, so I think that's it. Did I miss anything? Do you have any questions? No, I must have did a good job. Suzanne? Oh, yes, we take money. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yes, we um, we we always have a goal every year of raising about five thousand um, dollars. The five thousand dollars pretty much meets the needs of, of the community. Now that that may change this year, I'm not really sure. Last year, I had um, stepped away from the program. I probably should talk about that a little bit. Um, I've been doing the program for eight years and I wanted to retire from the program. So I found a couple of volunteers that were wonderful um, and they were managing the program last year and I didn't really have to do too much other than fill in and I was very happy about that because I've been busy and I've just wanted to do more things with my husband like travel. And so anyways, unfortunately, we had this wonderful family that lived in Barnstead that they were helping. They decided that they were going to move back home to where they had moved here about two years ago, not even, I don't think. And they moved back, I think, to Carolina, North Carolina or something like that. But anyways, they decided they wanted to move back home, which was unfortunate. And um, so we lost her. I was so sad because she was wonderful. And then the other volunteer, she got another job and that takes her traveling all the time and she couldn't commit. However, I did talk her in to staying and doing some of the reporting so I didn't have to deal with that. So she's helping a little bit with that right now, but she, she probably will end up leaving at the end of this year. So I, we reached out to the community and we found um, three new volunteers in Barnstead. Um, one that's very involved in the school, so we're very happy about that, and she has a child, so she's going to be doing packing of the bags, managing that, and then this young, nice young couple that just moved here, and they bought a house on Brindle Pond, and the, 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 the Palmieri's, uh, Tony and um, Kristen Palmieri, I was trying to get them to come this morning, that's why I was sitting in the back, because I was hoping they were going to come, they, they do have, I think they go to church somewhere else, and they have to be there at 8.30, but I said, oh, it's down the street from you, I hope you can come, um, they probably didn't make it in time, but um, lovely couple, um, really going out of their way, to, they got all the certifications that were required, and they really want to get involved in the community, so hopefully, Maybe you'll get to meet them. And then the, the other woman, uh, the, the mother, is uh, Leah Whitney. So those three people, I, I, you'll see it, their names um, on these handouts. You can definitely reach out to them. Um, so there I'm trying to get them more involved in the community so they can, you know, be more of the spokesperson so I can step back a little bit. So I'll still be there. I'll never let this program out of my sight. Um, you know, so I always want to be in the background uh, to make sure it stays in place in this community. But um, yeah, reached out and we got these great, great new volunteers. So yeah, so if you, yeah, hopefully you can reach out to them. I'm probably taking too much time. All right, any other questions? Did I answer your question? I don't even remember what it was. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I tend to over talk. You're good. Thank you for sharing all that great information with us. Listen, Jesus said, feed the hungry. I don't know what easier, I mean, all of our special offerings every month, I can get behind, we all can get behind, but this month, what else is there to say? Hungry kids in Barnstead, hungry kids in Pittsfield. So our special offering for the month 
is end 68 hours of hunger. If you would like to designate some of your offering this morning, all of your offering this morning to that organization, please just indicate on your envelope that this is for the special offering. But of course, we are also going to take our offering just for our general church budget at this time. So my friends, right now the morning's offering will be given and so gratefully received. world reveals and wars to own. All I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now compared to this. Knowing you dedication. Holy One, may this offering serve the people that you love, the places that you reside, and the kingdom over which you reign. May we strive to love the people you love, care for the places you reside, and work towards the kingdom that is being built in your name. Amen. Please rise for our hymn of preparation, Sanctuary.
when Kate asked if I would lead communion this morning, I immediately said yes, because communion is sometimes the most meaningful part of the service for me. For me, it's that tangible experience of God, the connection of the ordinary to the sacred. And, and I think that's what Jesus was for us who are Christians. Like Jesus, who fully inhabited communion, also showed us what it was like to be sacred, to show us a way to being sacred. So that's what we do in this sacrament today, a sacrament that is offered to anyone who feels that they want it. Anyone who has any sense of hunger for the sacred. So know that you are welcome at this meal, a meal that was founded when Jesus was together with his best buddies the last night of his life. And he took what was on the table, the cup and the bread, and he said, these can be vehicles of the holy for you. He took the bread, and he broke it. And he said, this bread, it smells good, the taste of this bread is my body broken for me. And he took the cup that was on the table and he poured it and said, this is the cup of blessing, a new, representing a new way for you to know me and God. So come, when we'll prepare, we'll invite you to come forward, take your elements and go to the side, and um, uh, we'll take the cup together. Does that, does that kind of tell you, you can eat your bread when you want, uh, and you're ready after prayer or, or thought. Um, but we'll take the cup because we do this meal together. It is a communion meal for us. So let us pray that this bread and this cup may become for us a vehicle for God. And this day, O oh God, where your creation is shining, we are grateful that the bread that comes from the earth and the cup that comes from the grape, God, is, is it a way for us to know of your creation, to know of your love for us, to know that you can enter into us in body and in soul. So use these elements, oh God, grape juice and bread, and help them to make us closer to you. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So come forward all who are hungry for God.
brothers, siblings in Christ, that as we drink this gift of life. And now we must be thankful for this gift and for what God has done. So let us pray. Oh, gracious God, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you that we are gathered together. Thank you for this cup and this bread that it can nourish us. Remind us always that you are with us, as you have done in this meal. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And uh, we have our going out hymn. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. <laughs> May the everlasting love of God give you peace, the surprising grace of God give you courage, and the creative will of God give you joy. As you release the traditions that have served their time, hold the traditions that inspire new life, and create traditions for a future promising and unknown. Amen. you till we meet again by good counsel guide uphold you with a shepherd's caring fold you God be with you till we meet again till we meet till we meet till we meet at Jesus us meet till we meet till we meet God be with you till we was written by none other than Kate Kennedy. And I read it and I thought, that's the way she preaches. I, I like what she had to say. It was there. So I, we can be very proud of you, I think. Our book group is starting on September 22nd. Um, I know we've got an initial order of books in, so if you ask me for a book, let me know. Um, they were 1350 this round of orders. But if you were not on the initial list um, for me to order you a book, 
Do not worry, there's still plenty of time. I'm happy to order you a book. Um, so just let me know. Um, or you can get it from your local library. Or you can get the audiobook on Audible. Um, or or Libro FM. Yes, again, or from your library. Um, the book is The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker. There's it's like The Art of Gathering. Subtitle. Yeah, subtitle, like what, how we meet and why it matters. Um, and the reason that we'll be looking at this book for six weeks, starting September 22nd, right after worship, is because we are going to start to put a why. I mean, this is work that you've probably already done as a congregation, but not with me. And we are going to think deeply about how we gather for worship and why. And then it will lead us to another conversation in the spring about our mission statement and how we can use our deeply felt mission statement to... Um, trigger warning, e word, evangelize our church to our greater community. Um, so there's sort of a, an arc to our year together, um, thinking about the why that we gather so that we can share our why with others. Uh, I hope you will join us for this book group, and let me know if you need a book. Ethel? Is there homework for the 22nd? There is not, well, no. Actually, I'm not sure yet. I gotta put the book group together. <laughs> you don't want us to read it for You can read it whenever you want. Doing the reading is better than not doing the reading. So if you have a ton of free time this week and you want to just read the whole book, let me know. Um, speaking of books, my daughter Jean um, co-directed a play that uh, Mr. Luca was in. He played many characters, and I have to tell you, you did a wonderful job doing all of them, especially the witch. <laughs> I'll tell you about it afterwards. But he um, he was very good. But my daughter Jean wrote a premise to the um, play on the bulletin. I forgot to bring it. And the first line was basically, I remember in the library when Ms. Frazier <laughs> gave me the book, the color, not the color, purple, I can't remember, the color of magic. And she went on to say how much that book impressed her. And I just thought that was really wonderful that you were on the first line. And um, and other people had read it and came up to Jeannie and said, you know Miss Frazier, she said in this book and she did this. So it's nice to know that you have touched people's lives yay with the books. Yes, yay librarians, yay. is right. Um, so thank you for that. And I also want to mention too, I forgot to bring it with me today. It's been kind of a crazy week for me. Um, but I do have pie boxes and cookie bags and all these other things with me. So I'll make sure I bring it um, next weekend so that any of you who want to bake, you can just put them in the boxes or bags or um, resealable cellophane ones. I got some bigger ones that we can put bars and stuff in too. So that's it for me. Anyone else? As Kate alluded to, uh, we've achieved a, a milestone, our goal for stabilizing the Pratt building. There have been many people who have helped uh, along the way. Uh, Jeff, Dan has done a, a lot of uh, background support work. And finally, yesterday, we uh, put the new sills in place with the help of Cheryl and Ryan. Ron Beck has been a godsend for getting this work done. And uh, Brandy West was here to help yesterday and make things go smoother. We will finish the details on leveling and so forth by Wednesday and it's good to use for the company client. Uh, as Laura said, we're going to be leaving for the year. And I just wanted to know that we're going to miss you, too. Uh, we're going to miss that sincere sense of community, service. We're going to think about you often and kindly. God willing, I keep that alive. <laughs> See you next summer.
reminds me to just say, please take those little squares about the fair. I mean, everywhere I've been going for the last few days, everyone I talk to, I say, are you coming to the fair? And they say, oh, tell me about it. And that's it. Anyway, and if you go any place, uh, we have lots of extras up front there you can take, or <coughs> Emily did a nice job posting them. Because all this work is only as good as our customers and as many people are, as are here buying it. So really, for the next two weeks, please flood all your friends. Um, again, Emily, in the, this month's newsletter, has all different designs, a black and white one, if you have yellow paper or some color you want to print it out on, but she also has colored invitations. Or just send them electronically to your whole contact list that's local. <laughs> anyway, it's... And I keep looking at Lori. Lori's like a Facebook queen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, I, I need to engage Lori. <laughs> the money's always going. I'll make sure to get it out there. Right, right. And then the day of it, um, we definitely will want somebody. If you remember, Nancy used to do this. She used to go on Facebook Live and walk around the fair and show people what there is. So um, then people that are home, oh, I forgot, I'll go. So anyway, this is promo time, big time. And then, of course, it's big time, lots of work too. So uh, make sure the customers are coming. Thank you. So have, have refreshments, and then we'll have a, a very quick, there's some issues that are bubbling up about the fair that people want to talk about, so we'll make it short. Thanks.